Welcome to the Axial Podcast. Axial is an early stage investment firm based in San Francisco. We partner with great founders and inventors investing in early stage life science companies often when they are no more than an idea. Axial is fanatical about helping the rare inventor who is compelled to build their own enduring business. Hey guys, how are you? Hey Josh, doing well, how are you? Just pretty busy, but uh, really excited to just catch up and just talk to friends. But uh, let's do some housekeeping. Um, you can click on my profile, make me a moderator so I can protect you from trolls. Done. Cool. Okay, great. <laughs> cool. I'm, I'm the troll. Clubhouse got kind of weird, to be honest. Clubhouse is just a tool for me, but I don't really like bringing up people I don't know to stage anymore. <laughs> to be honest, Liz is cool. Liz, if you want to come up, feel free to come up. Greg, Greg's a cool guy. So, Greg, if you want to ask questions, but <laughs> random people, I'm sorry. I can't, I can't talk to you. Uh, <laughs> to be honest, Clubhouse got really weird uh, over the last few months. Just a lot of weird questions. But uh, yeah, really I'm really curious, but I'm going to save asking you what sort of questions you've gotten uh, for maybe uh, offline. That's uh, honestly, I know the guy, he was like, Talk for 10 minutes about how UV light can kill COVID. I'm like, uh -oh. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, 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 this guy, is this, are you serious? Or the funniest thing I ever heard on this app, this lady was like, who invented RNA? And I was like, oh, <laughs> that is such a hilarious premise. Like, who invented RNA? I don't know, God? Uh, uh, I thought that was, such, that was probably the best thing I ever heard on Clubhouse, this lady t asking about vaccines. Uh, it's an earnest you just question. Never know. It's an earnest question. The answer is Bill Gates. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's Newbar, uh, Newbar, Derek Rossi, and uh, the whole crew. Yeah. Uh, but uh, great. Let me do the intros, and then we'll just get to it. And we'll just, uh, to be honest, is we might make this to a trilogy, or you know what I mean. So we could just like do this like the never-ending conversation. With awesome. James, with James and Denny's, but. Uh, yeah, everyone, really awesome to have James Siestra and Denny's Corral, the uh, founders of Seven Bridges, Tosha, and now they're executives at Absi, and you know the. You know, I'm sure they're going to do a lot more over the next few decades. Uh, but it's a really great conversation, not only about biotech and business development and platforms, uh, but also just two founders who have worked together for so long and, and about that experience of of uh, you know just building several companies together. And so, guys, do you want to do a quick introduction yourself and go? Yeah, happy to. Uh, so maybe even before that, I, I just want to uh, congratulate Josh on uh, the recognition last week. Uh, Josh is uh, one of the 30 under 30 for venture capital with a focus on life sciences. So well done. Um, and especially I, after that, you still made time for us, which we I appreciate. appreciate. You guys have to come to Berkeley. We'll go play some golf. Or something, and then uh, also the, the next list. I got to get on the Midas list. The Midas, yeah. That's my that's my next list. So I got to I got to get that. G give it a, give it a year. Give it a year. <laughs> uh, so uh, hi everybody. Uh, I'm James Seatstra. Uh, it's great to uh, join this clubhouse this morning and be part of the conversation. Uh, my background, uh, as Josh highlighted, I, I co-founded Seven Bridges. Close to a decade ago, we've been working together for a while. Uh, I see one Seven Bridges alum uh, in the room, Benyana. Uh, hey, Benyana, thanks for joining us. Um, and have been working in software and life sciences for about 15 years. Uh, before that was uh, at Harvard with Dennis. And um, really excited to talk about some of the um, next wave business models, leveraging new technologies in life sciences. Dennis? Hi. Um, yeah, uh, James and I have been working together for a long time. I'm an immigrant. I'm originally from Turkey. Studied math at Harvard. Uh, got a PhD in computational biology a long time ago. Worked at the church lab briefly, working on building a sequencer. Uh, worked on the Thousand Genomes Project. And after that, started Seven Bridges Genomics. Cool. Okay, most important question. Because since James and you, you and James are kind of similar but different, how did you two? Yeah, so um, we we were we lived next to each other at Harvard, uh, but never really hung out, and then reconnected 
uh, after college, uh, when uh, Dennis had founded Seven Bridges and was originally looking for investors, and I had I had founded a, an ad tech company um, right after graduation, had scaled that uh, to a, a pretty successful business and was looking into different investment opportunities. And Dennis has this Jedi mind trick and over the course of three hours, uh, sort of laid out his vision for how cloud computing and uh, machine learning, next gen sequencing uh, would transform cancer research from a descriptive to a predictive science. And I got super excited uh, and he convinced me instead of being just an investor to join him as an operator. Um, so really that Seven Bridges was a catalyst. Um, Dennis, anything to add? I, yeah, I think you covered it pretty well. Um, I, I, from my viewpoint, um, I was a first time founder in a PhD program and um, James already by then um, had some experience starting and scaling um, companies. So I thought he brought valuable um, experience apart from the uh, small investment and in hindsight, that was a pretty good uh, deal for the whole company, and here we are today. Really cool, yeah, James. I had to put you on mute just though some background noise. But uh, Dennis, maybe then, why did you start Seven Bridges? You you were from you, you were grad student at BU, and this is like the mid two thousands. What were you seeing, and 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 why was the right to run genomics, run platforms, and, and and what was that kind of initial premise of Seven Bridges? Yeah, so. Um, I, you know, in college, uh, I, I didn't have much of an interest in entrepreneurship, um, as, as you all probably know, uh, Mark Zuckerberg was our year and there were other successful entrepreneurs and I, I truly had no interest in, uh, I was a math major, but, um, taking a class with George Church was really, um, eye-opening for me. I, I got really impressed by um, what was happening in the area of uh, genome sequencing and synthetic biology back then. Um, and um, going to grad school was a natural evolution of that. I met my PI, Gabor Marth, uh, who's a great computational biologist, and he was working on the Thousand Genomes Project at the time. Um, which it may sound a little silly now, but it was the largest sequencing project in the world. Uh, we've sequenced a whopping 270 genomes at that point in time. And it, it was a pain to analyze because sequencing data was one of the few things growing faster or rather getting cheaper faster than Moore's law. So there are very few things that can outpace Moore's law, and this was one of them, and in both categories, both um, the amount of computation you need and the amount of storage you need. So if computers were not getting good enough, fast enough, that means, if it, as far as exponential things go, that means you need some sort of distributed solution. And um, a lot of graduate students like myself, we were getting pretty tired of um, um, running around data centers, writing uh, parallel computation tools. It was just very painful to manipulate and do analysis on a large number of genomes. And I, I felt that no graduate student should suffer like I suffered, but and instead should focus on the science and algorithm development and not uh, how to, you know, coordinate running a large job across a thousand servers. So that's that was the idea of Seven Bridges Genomics was essentially built to solve the problem that I saw the Thousand Genomes Project generated, and that turned out there were going to be many, many large-scale genomics projects, and that's exactly uh, what happened. We, at Seven Bridges, we eventually ended up hosting the Cancer Genomics Cloud for NCI, which is a very, uh, hosts a lot of large genomics data sets, including the Cancer Genome Atlas. Uh, we built Cavatica with uh, one of the, which is the largest pediatric genomics initiative, and it's led by Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Uh, we work with a, a wonderful PI there called Adam Resnick at Seven Bridges. 
and the Million Veterans Program and so on. So uh, that was the initial problem we saw, how to scale genomics. Cool. And two questions, and we'll talk more about Seven Bridges later in the conversation. Uh, you guys know Mark Kraganovich, any chance? I think he went there. Was he a year, year, or maybe a year older? Um, he's from Solve Bio. Yeah, uh, I know Mark, but, Mark Kraganovich, right. I know Mark. Yeah, he exactly. Was a college and so, like, the, yeah, all these stories where it's like, they all, everybody knew Zuck, right? Yeah, everybody, <laughs> everybody knew, knew about that. Facebook. Everybody yeah. knew Zuck. And it's like, was it, was it like, were you, uh, Facebook was an obvious success, right? It just, how does it feel to be like part of that class where it's like you see, one of your classmates just had this huge success with Facebook. And to be honest, I don't think Facebook was obvious. <laughs> yeah. But like, well, how was that experience? Was it a catalyst? So, so Dennis, James Dennis, huh? yeah. Can you, can you hear me better, Josh? Is there less feedback? Yeah, I think now? just like maybe when you stop talking, you push off a mute just because then I think yep. there's like echo, echo club. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so Dennis, I think, had the, the Zuck experience. Uh, it was in class with him. I had the, the opposite experience. I was rowing heavyweight crew and the, the Winklevoss twins were still in the boathouse. Um, so we, we brought competing uh, visions for what entrepreneurship might be like based on who we interacted with. They were still wearing their Connect You hats uh, in the, the boathouse when, when I was rowing. Um, but I think similarly, uh, yeah, it wasn't clear Facebook would be what Facebook is today. Um, nor was it clear that, you know, cloud computing and NGS would transform, uh, uh, drug development as much as it has. Uh, so I think it required sort of some amount of vision for, for the future in any case. And, um, neither of us were, were very discouraged. I, unlike Dennis, I've been starting companies and, failing uh, and succeeding in various forms since I was a teenager. My first business was a paint contracting company. Um, I, uh, I worked for a paint, paint contracting firm for two weeks and turned to my dad and said, hey, I can do this. And he said, be a painter? Yeah. And I said, no, uh, run a paint, painting business and uh, quit the next day and started a competitor. Uh, so for the record, I'm, I'm a terrible employee. I think Dennis is probably slightly better suited, but also a terrible employee generally. Um, Dennis, any comments on that? <laughs> um, so, I guess um, we're both employees right now, so I, I should walk that back. Yeah, I, I'll be honest with you. I'm pretty unemployable too, so I think we're all in the same type of a uh, uh, type of group. So, uh, but second question, Dennis. What is, What I'll say yeah. is, AppSci is a great place where uh, people who traditionally would not fit into a stodgy kind of uh, you know, 100,000 person pharma company infrastructure. So that was actually, and I'm sure we'll get to that in a minute, but that was one of the criteria that we looked at when we were brainstorming on exit opportunities for Toshin. We wanted, we looked, we looked beyond just the economics. We also looked for a cultural fit uh, mm -hmm. that would enable us to be productive inside. Well, yeah, and I yeah, Apps is a great company, to be honest. So it's going to be around for a very long time. So it's kind of guaranteed success. Uh, and, and, you know, so, but maybe, Dennis, one question about the Seven Bridges timing. Was it obvious to you that sequencing would outpace Moore's Law at the time? Or was that like a belief that you had to have? Because it, it seems, it, I don't know if it would be obvious in mid-2000s that sequencing costs would go down so quickly. Yeah, so for me, it was an example of the future being already there, but unevenly distributed. For me, it was pretty obvious because I was very lucky to see, um, you know, Rich Terry, Greg Poreka, Jay Shendier building the pollinator and offshoot instruments at the church lab. We were essentially building a sequencer. And part of my job was to uh, work with a another engineer called Mirko and Eric Garrison on picking uh, testing the different Hamamatsu cameras, the lasers, picking the fluorophores, writing pa uh, Python software to control the microcontroller, control the imaging. And I had this experience of seeing how a, uh, essentially a sequencing instrument would get built. And it, the underlying technologies that go into that instrument were scaling so fast and the costs were dropping so rapidly. We went from the $6 billion reference genome to the $300 million venture genome to just a couple million dollars. So it, it was just this amazing price drop. And um, it was just the, 
two years after the Solexa instrument launched that we launched Seven Bridges Genomics. And the Solexa instrument was really uh, what, what truly kind of kicked off this next-gen sequencing um, wave. Um, so at least to me, it, it was fairly obvious. And, you know, I think um, to Illumina's credit, they really invested in the Solexa platform and made it a, um, made it the big success it is today. Really interesting and helpful. Yeah, honestly, I'm trying to get the Selexa founders and, and be a case study of how to not sell too early anymore. You know, Selexa, like, <laughs> they sold for way too little, <laughs> way too little. Mm -hmm. But uh, maybe we can make the transition towards Toshint. And, you know, you guys are building the seven bridges and hundreds of, I think hundreds of employees or something, and all this revenue, all these customers, petabytes of data. Uh, what was that transition like to go from Seven Bridges to Toshint? You know, how did Seven Bridges set up Toshint? And what was that transition like from going from SAS Genomics to Drug Genomics? Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to give a bit of context. Um, so Seven Bridges, we, we decided to spin out right after we had raised a Series A. So we had close to $50 million in the bank. Uh, it was a successful and growing business. Josh, as you said, we had at the time more than 200 employees, uh, a lot of whom were technical PhDs or software engineers. We were well positioned going head to head with DNA Nexus on lots of deals. Our largest customer was paying mid single digit millions annually uh, in license and services fees. But we kept pitching these large pharma partners. We had supported two blockbuster checkpoint inhibitor programs on milestones and royalties. And they kept responding with, no, we'd prefer to keep paying you as a SaaS provider, uh, which is fair. They were paying us millions of dollars. Uh, but we saw a lot of value creation opportunity in participating more in some of the long-term downstream economics. We had some novel ideas of our own for internal discovery initiatives within the R&D group and had this itch uh, to, to realize some of those opportunities or pursue some of those ideas. Um, talked to uh, Rami Farid over at Schrodinger a lot about how Schrodinger structured internal development programs or discovery programs with their software business and considered pursuing a similar structure, keeping it all under one tent, decided in the end that the two businesses had distinct risk profiles, models, capital requirements, time horizons for return of capital. Um, so chose to spin out the R&D team, the bulk of the R&D team at Seven Bridges back in 2016. And the way we did it structurally, I don't know if this is boring or not, but we created Toshint. Uh, we also created a holding company. Seven Bridges contributed assets to Toshint in exchange for all the shares in the company. And then stockholders were able to contribute all or some of their shares in Seven Bridges into the holding company. Uh, and then Seven Bridges redeemed a portion of its shares held by the holding company in exchange for all the shares in Toshint. The net result of all this was we had this holding company where some of Seven Bridges shareholders um, now held their shares that owned a portion of Seven Bridges and all of Toshin. So we could go out and raise capital for both companies independently and there was no cross share ownership or entanglements that would potentially complicate um, one company's ability to, to raise capital. Um, Dennis, you, you can speak a bit more to some of the, the R&D projects we were pursuing, but that's from a business perspective, that was some of our thinking and how we how we executed on it operationally. Cool. Seems pretty complex, to be honest. So let's, not, <laughs> let's uh, I'll be honest with you. So let's just not let's just kind of skip over that whole corporate stuff. Uh, All right. A lot, fair. A lot of, how, I, I'm sure the lawyers were really expensive. So I feel, feel bad for you. Yes, uh, and it was very painful, and I don't necessarily recommend it unless you have a great reason to do it. Yeah, just don't. Yeah, I think uh, you, don't, what James said, don't do or try to avoid. <laughs> that's kind of the that's the lesson here. Also, uh, be, be, hesitate to use LLCs. There's downsides when it comes to the taxes at the uh, uh, the outcome once you sell one of the companies. Happy to talk offline to somebody about tax optimization regarding LLC structure, but not yeah, for this yeah, call. Definitely. <laughs> uh, so maybe we can talk about kind of that experience of 
you know, your day to day is focused on selling software, genomics, sequencing, and then how your day to day as founders shifted towards drug development and and targets and, and a whole it's a whole different like like uh, experience and how did you learn how did you update your skill set to become drug development CEOs uh, and who did you talk to how did you what mentors did you seek out because I think being a SaaS soft SaaS data CEO founders is a lot different in terms of being like a biotech CEO so how did you like update your Yeah, James, do you want to take it? Yeah, sure. So we, we talked to a lot of people uh, and read a lot. Uh, and I think there is years of trial and error, candidly. Uh, there is, it's a different uh, business. And a part of the hesitation um, from some of our partners at Seven Bridges was that we had been uh, SaaS founder CEOs but we had not done drug development. Uh, for anybody on this call that's looking to go raise capital from traditional life science investors, there's often a hesitation if you haven't at least brought an asset into the clinic in funding um, this sort of next wave of founders in life sciences. And I think in the first few years, we, we faced that. We had a lot of validation we had to, to show, um, but we found some champions, um, Johannes Fruhauf, who is the founder of Mission Biocapital and Lab Central, uh, Steve Tregay, who's the founder of Forma, um, mentors Marian Nakata over at J&J, &J, um, uh, good lawyers at Wilson Sonsini, Farah Garday, who just sort of knows everybody. And they helped us, uh, I, I think, get, get acquainted with the vernacular. Uh, and as the program, especially around the human derived antibody um, discovery, leveraging TLS, which Dennis, you can you can go into a bit more um, deeply. As the program advanced in those first few years, uh, there were a couple of tipping points where all of a sudden those connections we'd established with not only investors but strategic partners uh, became valuable because we could show them enough data. Uh, to validate some of our novel approaches to discovery, but it's a it's a grind transitioning from one industry to the next. And had we bis just been interested in sort of value maximization, uh, there was an argument to be made to sort of rinse and repeat what we knew how to do in selling genomic data analysis software. Yeah, and I think what was really helpful personally for me was the having the life sciences PhD, where you become. Um, accustomed to uh, at the pace of research and the risks involved. Um, it's So there was a good understanding on my part about the overall difficulty involved and the low chances of success. And I think any, any PhD student uh, sees a lot of failure day to day in the lab and things just not working out. Um, so I do think having uh, some sort of life sciences academic background is actually a good um, introduction to the um, the job of being in a life sciences company and getting comfortable with um, risky research projects and doing things on the cutting edge. And in fact, I think to some extent, uh, some of the larger companies um, over time lose the appetite for doing novel and risky things without with an uncertain outcome. Um, and to to Double down on something James said, I, we really benefited from finding the right early backers, the early believers. Um, we primarily relied on seed funding at Toshin and um, beyond just the initial investment, our, our early uh, seed investors truly believed in the mission. And I think what they saw was a balanced approach combining um, algorithmic data-driven approaches that that we are essentially kind of digital natives in, in life sciences, uh, combining that with uh, more traditional drug discovery approaches. And, and I think despite some of the, you know, our, our, our lack, lack of experience, the novelty of that combination made it exciting enough for people to kind of approach us as an experiment. And a lot of early backers did call us their experiment in, in this type of computational and let's say, less computational approaches to drug discovery. 
Cool. Let's make this transition, shift gears, and talk about drug development platforms and use Toshin and, and Absci as kind of the, the case studies. And so when you guys started Toshin, and you guys are coming from like a SaaS background, genomics background, and then you're trying to make drugs, you know, how did you think about your platform at Toshin versus platforms in the past, especially the value? Yeah, so we as uh, we had a very um, um, specialized approach to human derived antibody technology, and I think um, that really helps. So I can maybe briefly describe that. We were looking for uh, patients with uh, a specialized type of immune response called a, a tertiary lymphoid organ, and this is a mature germinal center present inside uh, the tumors of patients. And they produce these affinity matured clonally expanded antibodies. And we used bulk RNA-seq data to mine uh, heterogeneous tumor sequencing and reconstruct antibodies from these rare patients with this type of immune response, and then figure out if these antibodies did anything. Um, so we, we are not the only human antibody discovery company in the world, but we are one of the handful primarily human-focused companies. And among all the human-derived antibody discovery companies, we had a really unique approach and a unique platform on how we went about doing that. It was heavily reliant on computational biology and sifting through um, the patients and antibodies with a specialized uh, algorithm um, so in that sense, um, I think it, it was a differentiated platform and it could, it could add something to big pharma, uh, it's something they didn't necessarily have in-house or had time to build out. Um, so I think that, that makes it particularly attractive and, uh, humanization remains a big challenge in biologics discovery. Um, so starting with fully human material still to this day has its advantages. Um, there's a lot of focus these days, justifiably on, uh, de novo design and fully, you know, ML derived design, but all those resulting proteins still need to get fully humanized to avoid, um, various immune reactions and downstream issues. Okay. Awesome. I think, uh, so we had Jacob Oppenheim, <clears throat> I think last week and you guys did a deal with him at EcoRx. And so Jacob yeah. was discussing about, you know, acquiring data sets and then standardizing them and then generating their own data. How did Toshin think about acquiring public data or which public data sources to use versus internally generating your own data set? Yeah, I think it's very problem specific. So um, in our case, there was just so much published bulk RNA-seq data that that it, it just made sense to start there and start using those data sets. And at the time, and actually still to this day, there just weren't a lot of efforts or success at reconstructing correctly paired antibody sequences from those data sets. Um, and we were uniquely able to do that. So there wasn't really much of a downside on relying on public data set because the way we used and transformed it was still quite unique for our company. But we did not want to stop there. So we did actually establish partnerships with hospitals. Uh, we speak about our Avera partnership quite a bit um, that James set up for us. Um, and we we are rapidly expanding the, the um, kind of partnership side and getting our own data set as well. For some applications relying on big data, it does make sense to generate bespoke data and close that loop of generating data, training your models that generate new hypotheses and just kind of generating that flywheel effect. So I think both approaches make sense and public data is an excellent place to start bootstrapping that and once you churn through all the public data, you can expand from there. Interesting. So, you know, I think, you know, sequencing data is commoditized enough and antibodies are kind of well characterized enough that you just kind of need a unique question or hypothesis like you guys had, which is, 
you know, finding antibodies from like intratumoral B cells. Right. So, uh, what, uh, uh, how many antibodies did Tosha end up having at the end before you guys got acquired? Was it like 10,000 or 100,000? What's a big number? Yeah, so we, we are very selective and filtered down um, significantly. And we've actually observed uh, millions of millions of unique uh, CDR3 sequences in our data sets, but ultimately we were looking for high quality uh, germinal center based clonally expanded affinity matured antibodies. So ultimately at the time of our acquisition, and this is fully public information available on the S1, uh, we had a, uh, roughly 4,000 antibodies at the time of our acquisition that are based on processing over 50,000 uh, patient samples. Cool. Well, congrats on that. Now let's talk about, use that to set up the Absci acquisition. Maybe James, because James is, honestly, everyone, James is a master negotiator. You know, when I have a portfolio founder, like, oh, just talk to James. James knows that he's been doing business. I, I, James, I didn't know you did, you did paint. So he's been doing business for the last 25 years or something uh, from paint to biotech. Uh, that's going to be the title of this podcast. Um, but uh, how did... Uh, how did <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> seriously. Uh, but how did, you, how did you two think about getting... Uh, why, well, did you, why, did, why did you take... Why did you... Yeah. Uh, can, you just, can you just talk about that experience of building Toshit and then getting acquired by Apple? Yeah. Uh, Dennis, were you about to... I didn't no, no. I you. was going to say uh, the roots of the pharma industry actually came from dye manufacturing. So the paint to biotech is the story of pharma over the last 150 years. So uh, it, it fits very well that, uh, the, you know, it's not actually a bad... This is what I was thinking about when I was on the side of those houses, uh, pushing my brush back and forth. Uh, my vision for uh, uh, computational biology uh, all the way back in 2002. Um, so, J Josh, your, your question, and thank you uh, for the credit. Um, I, we originally weren't looking to sell the company. Uh, so it's, it's been a very productive year. Uh, for the Toshin team, we we went into 2021 with a lot of leverage. We came out of stealth for Toshin uh, last September. So it's been just over a year since we came out of stealth. And we announced $10 million in seed funding um, from some of the names that we've highlighted previously, Mission Bio Capital, Sands Capital. Uh, Jonathan Milner was an investor of ours. He's the co-founder of Abcam, still deputy chairman. Um, we were a J Labs company. We had a strategic uh, antibody discovery partnership with Ginkgo, which we had announced fall of last year as well. So we were well positioned to raise a Series A, and we kicked off a process with the target of raising 50 million uh, to advance one of our candidates into the clinic. And by March, we had a highly competitive process running with multiple blue chip VCs, strategics. Um, we were running a bunch of things in parallel. And uh, one day the CEO of a strategic who we had asked for some, some help in uh, sort of back channeling with one of the VCs that we were uh, serious about said, well, don't raise capital, um, sell your company to us instead. And one of the things we learned at Seven Bridges um, a, a lesson that we uh, learned painfully, we said no to a term sheet uh, from a strategic and in hindsight, we probably should have said yes, or at least seen it. Um, we told the CEO, great, appreciate the interest, show us a term sheet, please. Um, and we then communicated to several other strategics that this was in play. And we found ourselves then having two competitive processes running in parallel, one of which was series A, the other was um, an acquisition. And Absi, for lots of reasons, was the best possible fit for us. Um, it combined our discovery strategies with Absi's platform for optim optimized therapeutic protein design and biomanufacturing. It allowed us to de-orphan all these antibodies we'd computationally assembled and really build the, the largest collection of human-derived antibodies 
uh, tissue specific human derived antibodies and target antigens ever. Um, and we, we found not only the science really exciting, but also the, the, the culture and Sean McLean, I mean, you've had him on here, Josh, um, built his company over the last 10 years from a basement lab. And it really is, if we were going to be employees anywhere, not a bad place for us to be employees at, uh, uh, we get along well with the team and the, the, the vision is just really exciting. It reminds me of early days at seven bridges when we sort of predicted what the next few decades would look like. Um, and then we, we merged with Absai 48 days before their IPO, um, and, uh, sort of rode that momentum and we sold. So based on the stock price during the first 10 days of trading, uh, the cash and stock total consideration to acquire Toshin ended up being somewhere between 101 and 124 million. And um, we sort of did the math and saw the upside in, in combining our technologies and decided it was worth selling earlier than we had originally thought. We thought we were going to take this into building a public company or be acquired, you know, once an asset was in the clinic. Um, so it was it was unexpected, but a great a great turn of events, and you know couldn't be happier with the outcome. Awesome, yeah. I think uh, well, first of all, congrats, and uh, yeah, I think you know you have a pile of cash, and you work in a great company, and now you get to do a lot more. You know, you get a you, you got you two are leveling up, right? I think as founders, as a duo, you know, each five years, each company, you you're leveling up, and so I think the the best is yet to come. Um, but maybe to talk about especially for James, maybe specific tactics around, you know, how do you engage partners? I think what you just said, I'm, I'm a little snippet and, you know, like how to, what, how to talk about fundraising and create, you know, create a, create the right type of momentum. Um, so how do you think, seriously, uh, uh how, how do you think about engaging partners? How do you think about closing deals? Are there any little tactics or little kind of little tricks you've, you, you've kind of collected over the years in terms of like, you know, talking to one, you know, just like talking to VCs and, and getting them engaged with you. Uh, I think you, you alluded to just, you know, taking the money, right? I think some founders, you know, when there's money on the table, they kind of bungle it and they don't take the money. And that's always a mistake. If there's money on the table, you should just get it. You should get it. So any, any little tactics you've, you've picked up along the way in terms of like engaging partners and close? Yeah, I think it's a delicate balancing act. Uh, I'm a big fan of, of uh, taking the money on the table. Uh, but on the flip side, uh, the single best thing you can say to an investor or potential acquirer is no. Uh, there's nothing that gets a buyer more excited than you saying, I'm not going to take your money. I don't need it. Uh, so I think you have to, if you can walk a fine line between making uh, the, the buyer or investor, um, fight for participation, uh, with not, you know, turning them away. Uh, that's a, that's a fine line worth walking, but it, there's no sort of magic formula for doing that. Um, the, 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 the best way to position for that is to have good validation for your asset or whatever you're selling. If it's a discovery platform, have a resultant asset that is well validated in a data package. So have your science check out. Um, and in addition to that, I think having competition so you can you can posture and you're not beholden to a single potential buyer. Um, both of those things enable you to run uh, efficient processes and sort of get maximum value for what you're selling. And that's true if you're trying to do a licensing deal. That's true if you're selling a company. It's true if you're bidding on a paint contract. I mean, these are uh, less true. It's actually less true if you're bidding on a paint contract. Um, but I think these are, are, are sort of generalizable um, uh, ways of engaging competitive processes and, and selling things. Dennis, what, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think I think we got Cool. I think... Uh... Competition is the key word here. You know, competition between bidders, and that's always that. You know, as an investor, I'm always trying to avoid auctions. But then, if I invest in a company, I want to send my portfolio companies to the auction. And so, it's kind of that's how I think about things. And I think you know, it's always nice when you have a lot of people who want you, and then 
Um, and then if you want something, you're, you're one of the few people who, who get it. So it's kind of it's, um, you know, uh, always a balancing act. But maybe we can then shift gears and talk about platforms and now in the context of Toshin and AppSci. And so maybe, you know, ha, ha, can you talk more about how Toshin fit into AppSci? You know, AppSci had also bought a company called Denovium. Yeah. Um, two years before. And can you just talk about the premise of AppSci? And then, and then, and now, how to how Toshin, how's Toshin like adding? Right. So I'm, I, I'm very excited overall about the premise of synthetic biology, right? And where it's heading. Um, and the, the, at the very beginning, we started with this idea of how do you turn biology from a descriptive science into a predictive science? Um, because initially it, it kind of started out like stamp collecting, right? Collect different specimens and make different observations. A lot of them being molecular observations, but we had very poor tools to perturb a biological system and truly do predictive experiments and um, test how those will be. And the better a toolkit we get with synthetic biology, um, uh, the better we can, we can actually design things and uh, turn biology into a predictive science. Um, so reading DNA, we're now pretty good at. That's, that's what the sequencing uh, revolution has enabled. Uh, it's very cost effective to read DNA. And now with um, synthetic biology, uh, under, which, under whose umbrella I include um, DNA editing, uh, DNA synthesis, and other kind of genetic manipulation technologies, we're now able to write uh, genomes as well. And AppSci, broadly speaking, provides us with that ability uh, to also write into organisms and um, complete that loop of read writes genomics for biological engineering. Uh, the Denovium acquisition was also very important because not only do we need to be able to read biology and write biology, but we kind of need the brain in between to design and figure out what we want to write, right? And make sense of what we just read. So that's where a lot of AI comes in. Uh, humans are still really, really bad at um, designing biological systems and designing proteins. We don't really know how to design the right antibody for the right target or the right enzyme. Um, and AI is probably the best tool we have alongside wet lab biology to actually design the stuff we want um, and improve upon nature. Um, so that's where the de novium acquisition and the focus on machine learning comes. And the overall vision for AppSci is through combining Toshent, AppSci's existing business, and Denovium, it, it kind of makes progress on um, this journey synthetic biology is having of get, be, doing more and more of these steps in silico of making sense of genomes, designing novel proteins, and ultimately carrying out the lab work to uh, generate organisms to produce these uh, proteins. Um, the most lucrative application of this technology currently is uh, in kind of therapeutics and um, drug development. So a lot of our focus at AppSci has been helping our partners develop better medicines, focusing on next generation biologics. And Toshin had had this focus on uh, targeting tumor-specific membrane antigens that are really a key aspect of enabling a lot of next-generation biologics. And uh, a lot of the antibodies we discover create content that can go into a bispecific or chimeric antigen receptor uh, and a number of different modalities which AppSci is really good at engineering and optimizing. Absolutely. I think, you know, AppSci might have the best one of the best marketing terms for antibodies, um, you know, do you guys have bionic proteins? Bionic, there you go. <laughs> bionic, whoever, I can't believe AppSci is the first one who thought about that. Um, but could you talk more, I think one thing for AppSci is like, you know, you, you guys are doing like a one-stop shop for antibody discovery. You know, you, AppSellera, maybe Alloy. 
And I think there's a really compelling slide in the S1 where you guys compress the timeline from years to months because Abside not only discovers the, the E. coli that's humanized, or no, that's a yeast uh, that's kind of made to be human-like, and then you also discover the antibody all in, all in one step. And so that's kind of really compelling. So I think I think is going to do very well in the next few de the next decade at least. Um, and so could you talk more around kind of this this topic of platform partner fit? You know, Abside definitely has a unique business model, and Toshin definitely had a unique business model. And so how do you two think about you know building platforms out, getting partnerships? You know, how do you think about um, making sure that you retain the value of the platform and and not you know, give away a crown jewel. You know, how do you think about data in that context? Uh, but this overall discussion around platform partner fit. You know, how does Absci and Slash Toshin think about it? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, uh, and I think it will remain an active conversation uh, within Absci. It has been for us for for years leading up to the acquisition at Toshin. Uh, Absai is a bit different from some of the traditional uh, biologics discovery platforms in that um, there's no interest in a fee-for-service model. Uh, we are relatively choosy about the programs we partner, uh, and we want to have conviction around the biology because uh, we expect downstream economics on those programs. So even though we're we're preclinical partners, uh, typically um, we're looking for uh, sort of the next ten years for these assets to advance and be clinically successful. Uh, so we you, you'll see more, I think, partnerships like EQRX, uh, where they're multi-target deals, uh, and where we have the potential to realize some of that long-term value creation um, and we're we're deeply invested so the reflective of sort of what Dennis and I have done in the past both at seven bridges and Toshin um, Absai is investing and in moving more and more to in silico design and optimization I, I think arguably we have the largest AI team in biologics in the industry at least from from a sort of non-internal perspective um, and that investment is sort of the beginning. Uh, we intend to do a lot of platform and infrastructure investing uh, to be able to continue, Josh, as you said, sort of compression of timelines, not only compress timelines, but uh, be able to offer technologies that are truly differentiated from other companies in the space. Um, but it's not going to be a prolific uh, engine insofar as we're not, we're not looking for fee-for-service arrangements and to do small projects with hundreds of companies, we're, we're looking to um, partner selectively and uh, participate in the downstream economics. Absolutely. Yeah, you just want to work with the best. So you work with Jacob at EcarX. You work with, um, I think you guys work with Merck or Novartis. I forgot. You work with a bunch of companies, uh, Amgen yep. maybe. Uh, so you guys work with everyone. Uh, so everyone good you work with. So I think Absai <laughs> is a good company. And also, I'm be honest with you, you guys hired a really, you hired a, I don't know if it's announced yet. I won't, I won't announce it, but you guys just hired a genius from Facebook. So congrats on that. That guy is a genius. J that, Josh? That, yeah, Josh, man. Yeah. You guys, yeah. I can't believe you hired Josh. I, I don't know if it's public. Yeah, I, but seriously, congrats on hiring like Josh from Facebook. I don't know. I won't name his last name. Let's keep him a mystery, but the, he's a legit protein engineer. So, um, you should guys next hire is Bart, right? So get Bart on board. Um, we, we we are fortunate. We're fortunate to you, you get sort of uh, network effects, right? Where people want to join that team, and um, yeah, we we've got a really strong on, on multiple uh, layers, a really strong uh, set of people contributing to building for the long term, which is pretty neat. Yeah, seriously. And capital. Yeah, I mean. Uh, I mean, Absai is such a great story. You know, Sean, he moves, he, he moves back to his parents' house in, you know, Vancouver, Oregon. And he's like doing his work in a basement lab and he's trying to make E. coli human-like. And he spends a, a year tinkering. It's, it's really honestly a story of a great inventor tinkering, having a vision, 
and then like taking a lot of business model risk and social risk and it worked out which is pretty cool and so being part of that i'm sure that the culture today kind of is is uh, is connected to that founding story it right? is it kind of probably persists there's probably small little things that you aren't talking about that like like are really unique because of how the company was founded and because abside you know and plus vancouver oregon great place to live i mean in terms of taxation so I really so we sean is absolutely tenacious uh part a big part of the reason dennis and i chose abside was uh sean matthew weinstock uh greg the cfo we met the executive team and uh we just felt so confident that uh through sort of the next however many years the next decade the company was well positioned and had the vision to execute, take risks, and then just tenaciously go after it. Sean is unwilling to take no for an answer, uh, which is fantastic uh, when you're selling into uh, organizations with lots of inertia and bureaucracy. Um, and you're right, Washington State Governor Inslee came to our grand opening recently, and um, we have lots of support. Uh, it's a it's a great place to live. It's beautiful. The facilities are are great. Uh, Dennis can comment on sort of the labs, but we we rocked up after we had sold the company, and both of us were pleasantly surprised at just the extent of the capabilities. We had, we sold the we sold Toshin to Absai without ever having seen the place. Um, so it was nice when everything checked out. Yeah, I mean the you mentioned the location. And uh, the lab is quite impressive. It's 77,000 square feet of purpose-built labs for AppSci. And uh, the first time I visited there, I was just constantly doing the math of how much that would set a company back to have a lab of that size in either Cambridge uh, or, or uh, this, either San Diego or San Francisco. And I think that's one of the advantages of our location is to have uh, such a high throughput, uh, automated and large scale lab facility that, uh, the, the kind of the more computational technologies ultimately rely on and benefit from, and we can just generate a massive amount of data in-house now, uh, through both our E. coli technology and other high throughput assays. Yep, I mean, I love trees. That's why I live in Berkeley. And so I, I would, I would go live in Washington State. If it, it, there's no sun, though. That's the issue, though. But uh, there's a lot of trees. But maybe we can shift gears. One last question on the platform side. At Absci and, and, and Toshin, part of it, you know, you, you guys have the ability to discover antibodies and validate new targets, but you also have an E. coli platform to manufacture this stuff. That's very rare, right? Most antibody discovery platforms just discover the, the antibody, but they can't help you make it. Where Absai is one of the, I think maybe the one of the few that can discover the antibody and like the chassis that's gonna make it. How does that help you in BD discussions and partnership discussions? And is that a major advantage? And, 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 and be able to have discovery and manufacturing all in one like product. Uh, yeah, w w like w w w what kind of advantages Yeah, so maybe I'll just speak quickly to the BD side, and then Dennis, it might be worth just sort of expanding on some of the capabilities um, uh, beyond antibody discovery and optimization. Um, we have it's it's both an opportunity and a challenge, Josh, to take this uh, drug creation platform with a stack of complementary technologies for next gen biologics and figure out, you know, with J and J or with Novartis, where the matches are. It's a many-to-many -many problem. Um, the nice thing is if we establish a beachhead, say with a, an asset deal, we're out licensing uh, a reasonably well-characterized antibody, and then it naturally leads to a cell line development conversation, a lead optimization conversation. These beachheads are particularly useful to us because Absci has so many complementary capabilities. The challenge, however, is focus. Uh, so we need to be, and as part of the BD organization, now now leading the BD uh, team, uh, we need to be disciplined about how we focus on our outreach uh, and um, how we match uh, sort of the initial engagement with where R&D is focused within the organization. Dennis, anything to add on sort of 
the broader tech stack? Yeah, I think speed is an important component here. That's one of the major advantages of this type of vertical integration where we can take something from target to discovery to building that chassis and scale the tighter um, of, the, of the product uh, we're developing very rapidly. And I think COVID is a good example where this type of vertical integration is very helpful uh, in terms of meeting rapid deadlines and uh, pandemic rapid response requirements uh, where having all these capabilities in-house allows us to go from uh, a, a, a patient who's infected with the disease to a manufacturing ready cell line in, uh, in a, you know, in a low numbers, low single digit number of months. Yep. I mean, you know, I've, I think invest in a few antibody platform startups and the biggest barrier is like the five to $10 million you need for like manufacturing to get to IND. And so you like, you, you discover an antibody and then you have to like pay Lonza a bunch of money to get to IND and then you have to go, and that helps you raise more money. Whereas AppSide and your partners, you kind of solve that problem from day one, or at least early, really early. Totally. And then that allows you to have more shots on goal. And then, to be honest, in drug development, I don't know if you could predict, it's one antibodies have a higher success rate in the clinic than other modalities by a pretty big margin. Uh, and, you know, I don't, it's, hard to, it's hard to like engineer success in the clinic right now, but at the very least you can like engineer more shots on goal. And if you have more shots on goal, you have more drugs, just based on the numbers. You and said so, it well. That's it. <laughs> to be honest, that's it. And then I think AppSide, a big theme, the thing I'm looking for, one of the biggest events I'm looking forward to in biotech and next decade, hopefully, is like the first bio bond. Like the first company that securitizes a bunch of drugs in a bond and then like sells the bond and it gets money from it. And I think AppSide could do it, right? I think you, one day you guys could make a bio bond. And so whoever makes the first bio bond, I think it's gonna be a big pivotal event, and so I think Could, I had, yeah. Couldn't Axial do this, Josh? Isn't isn't this uh, uh, something yeah, a creative yeah. structure you could put together? Yeah, but I don't I don't <laughs> generate IP. I just read all day, so I don't know. It's, it's tough, right? I don't like I don't do anything but read and talk. You'd to have people. to broker some partnerships. Uh, maybe, I don't know. Maybe, I think honestly, maybe Absai plus Axial. I yeah, exactly. I might have portfolio companies, but to be honest, within the whole, this is a side note, like for secret, securitization of biotech and like bio bonds. I bet there's going to be like a Michael Milken type of character. It's not going to be me, but like there's going to be some sort of like Michael Milken who like brokers a bunch of assets in a bond and like talks, you know, is really charming and can get Merck and Novartis all to work together and like create these like, you know, uh, you know, high yield debt of drugs. I'm sure that happens actually, but uh, yeah, that's something I'm really looking forward to actually. Um, and I think Absi has a unique platform to get more shots on goal, move more quickly and kind of reduce yeah. the, ba the barriers to initiate a trial. Um, and so I think, I think Absi is going to do very well. So congrats on uh, selling Absi. And I'm, I think the future looks really bright for the company and it's you two in particular, because I think it's pretty obvious how well you two complement each other. Uh, <laughs> seriously, <laughs> I, think, I think it shines Thank out you. pretty well. Um, maybe to, to wrap it all up, yeah, kind of what are you two looking forward to over the next year? That's a great question. Uh, I am looking forward to, uh, well, I, I don't know, I guess I can't, I can't make any predictions since we're a public company about the number of uh, uh, programs we're gonna uh, close. So I'm looking forward to being successful at ABSI in my role. Um, and I won't, uh, I won't translate that into to any sort of metric uh, since now we're trying to, to get used to being a public company. Um, and just executing. It's it's really exciting the the complementary nature of uh, the technologies apps I had with what Toshin brought and what Denovium brought. Um, we've got the capital, we've got the infrastructure, we've got the team. There's there's no reason we can't be really successful. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, hopefully more trips up to uh, to Washington. And on one of them, Josh, you can come with us. Yeah, and while we have the audience, maybe what we could say is we're looking forward to working with innovative startups and innovative structures. We're a very inclusive platform company, and uh, there's still lots of areas in which we love bringing on partners. So um, I guess that would be a good takeaway in the next year. 
uh, James and I are actually looking forward to meeting new companies, new founders, um, and uh, learn more about what they're doing and see how we could complement what we offer at AppSci. Great point. You no, know, Dennis, I'll send you. I'll send you an email. I have a bunch of portfolio yeah. companies. So I'll just send you. I'll send you a long <laughs> list of startups, uh, and we can go from there. But cool, guys. Let's hang out. If you guys are in Berkeley, let's just get some coffee, uh, walk around town, and have fun. But uh, always great chatting. And yeah, thanks for taking the time to talk to us. And uh, yeah, have a great day. Thank you, Josh. guys. Congratulations again. Midas list next. Yeah. Midas, <laughs> exactly. I got a. I think we have an investment. We're in business with a guy named Aaron Ring. I think Aaron, we should talk to Aaron Ring, actually. I think Absai and Aaron could do something together. Because Aaron, in my opinion, he's the, he's the best protein engineer in the world, in my opinion. I'm very biased. And so uh, he, he's going to start, a, he's gonna start a bunch of companies. So um, yeah, he's a, uh, hopefully, I think his companies are going to get the biggest. So uh, if I just, you know, my, my model is to just stick close to great scientists and great founders and just hold on for dear life and be useful. And then like, you know, good things happen. Uh, it's like being a movie agent for a scientist. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty sweet life actually. So uh, I appreciate it. That's a good uh, metaphor. I love it. Movie. Honestly, agent, yeah. you gave me a great analogy. Honestly, when we spoke, I, I looked in, I started studying Amet from Atlantic Records. Uh-huh. And I, like, I, I read his biography. I, when we, I, we spoke like a year ago about it. Oh, yeah, years. I remember. And I really got, I really studied the guy and it was really fascinating. He like, he, he actually wrote songs. Like he like, yeah. he spelled his name backwards and he would write songs. And I think the key lesson is his success was he took a lot of social risk. Where yeah. like, you know, he's like this, you know, son of a diplomat in Turkey, but he loves blues, uh, you know, so he like goes to the American South and maybe, you know, the, what the forties or something and probably a lot of racism and stuff, but he takes yeah. a lot of social risk to like work of, I don't know, Ray Charles or something. Uh, I think, I think that's a big lesson in history is just like smart people who take social risk and that's like Absai, right? I think it's you two, right? James, you did heavyweight rowing. Right, but then you link up with Dennis, Dennis, right? <laughs> you take some, you take a lot of social risk. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm gonna be honest with you, right? I think. Wow. <laughs> That's a, how do you feel good about one, that, Dennis? <laughs> I'll get him later. Get him. <laughs> you get me later, Dennis. <laughs> and I think, De- <laughs> I'm sorry, Dennis. But yeah, it's, I think it's you know that's why I think you guys works out so well together because you guys are very similar but kind of different too. And so uh, you guys complement each other really well. And so I think, you know, a lot of, uh, I think that's why you guys, I think it's even so successful because of that reason. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. You're good. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, that's cool. What a way to. You read up on uh, Ahmed Artigan, founder of uh, Atlantic Records. Yeah, that's. He's I did. Guy. I mean, I studied David Geffen. Who else yeah. do I study? Uh, I study um, uh, Ari Gold, you know, as you got to watch Entourage. You know, Ari Gold, the case study. <laughs> you That's gotta, great. Uh, but a few other folks. But uh, cool, guys. Let me, uh, I know you guys are busy, so we'll, we'll talk soon, man. And uh, have, have a great day. You, you awesome. too. Bye-bye. Thanks, so much. Thanks everybody. Bye. We'll talk soon. Bye.